Why are you so hard on yourself? When I'm reading a book, <laughs> when I'm reading a book, you keep putting yourself down. You keep talking you about so? your obtuseness. You keep talking about your insensitivity, uh, about your uh, unrealistic expectations. Uh, uh, are, are you are you projecting from yourself to us, the the reader, and and kind of seeing us in you and you in us, uh, or are are you sincere in the, these the self deprecation? Yeah. Well, I have chosen just I guess to look at it like authenticity you know there were certain chapters I wrote and I when I remember when I started in on them early in the book and I I would start to write things that sounded very beautiful and and polished and things like that and then I kind of went back to my own heart and said that's not how I felt in the moment uh, in the moment I was angry in the moment I was disappointed in the moment I was exhausted and if I had tried to romanticize this part of the story um, it, it will not assist anyone, and, and I just can't be that person, and I'll be held accountable before God if I'm being real or not real. And I think there's also moments in that where people say, I, in my brokenness and flawedness and uncertainty of what to do, can still offer something. Whether, I mean, hopefully the themes in the book are transferable from just poor and homeless people to your next door neighbor. One of your chapters is entitled The Boy I Hated. I think his name was Desmond. Yeah. Uh, that's quite the title. Why did you hate this kid? He was just, um, he was the stereotype for, uh, I think, what people think homeless people are. He kind of would call out to people, and if people wouldn't give him money when he was panhandling, he'd kind of say things to them. He was dirty and loud and kind of vile and all the things that you'd think about a rebellious street kid would be. And it was just easy to dislike being with him. I mean, it's different when you know a little girl like you talked about Kareen who was sweet and quiet and timid and you knew her story and here was this aggressive boy. So it was easy. I mean the end comes around in that chapter that even I with all my experience once I knew his story had to remember that I was called to love him. Wasn't he from a very affluent home? Yeah. And had been seriously, uh, verbally, if not physically, abused by his father. That's right. And uh, when we made contact with the parents, they were just, yeah, the whatever, way, he's out on his own. You, you end up seeing him uh, on the beach in, uh, in Vancouver playing yeah. a guitar, singing yeah. with a bunch of other young yeah. people and looking like he had it together. Yes. You kind of uh, make eye contact, but you don't follow it up. What, were, were you not tempted to say, come on, let's have a coffee and tell me about the last yeah. few years? Yeah, well, there are a few chapters in the book. You know, I do that with some that, that we meet and some. Um, there's such a history of brokenness that you need to leave them space. There are many of my friends from the street who once they leave the street to be well, they really have to leave the street and contact and community in the same way does not work for them. There are others that come back and they want to be part of that. But part of the whole culture, especially if you've had serious drug addictions or serious um, physical and sexual hurts on the street, if you've been prostituting all kinds of things, if you've been beaten up on the streets, all those touchstones are painful to you and hurtful to you. So I kind of always leave that space if I re-meet one of my friends who are off the street for them to decide how close and how healthy they are to come forward. This is what I would call non-directive counseling to the max. I mean, you, 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 <laughs> you really do keep arm's length. Uh, you, you, sh you give them space, you give them uh, respect. Uh, you don't insist that they conform to any subcultural uh, norm. Yeah, I mean, we always said we, the sense when people are asking me questions like what are the most important things to deal with on the street? Is it disease? Is it food? Is it uh, shelter? And uh, I always come back and say, no, the real issues on the street are trust, hope, and dignity. And uh, people would guess quickly about the trust and the hope issues based on the conversations. But the dignity issue is so huge and that we can dignify people who we think, I don't even care about that. But we dignify them with their story, with their past, with their history, with their with the conversations we do have and as much with the conversations we don't have. Now, a percentage of these people are mentally ill. Huge. Uh, the older you get, the more that's um, part of the picture, for sure. Now, why are these people on the street? Should they not be in institutions? <laughs> I guess well, that's the, that's the classic that. question that's asked. Yeah. Basically, in Canada, this is my take on it. 
People talk about um, poverty when it comes to street and homelessness around the issues of poverty of resources, money. Do we, can we throw more money at it? Can we throw more money at it? Well, in this country, no one should be poor. No one needs to be poor. We have more than enough. The real issue in our country is poverty of relationship. Not poverty of resources, but poverty of relationship. It's part of what we're trying to communicate now, um, me and some of my friends that work in the same area and in Youth Unlimited, Youth for Christ, is the idea that if I, Tim Huff, lost everything today, or if you, Jim Campbell, you lose everything today, every penny you have, will you end up on the streets tomorrow panhandling? No, but is it because you don't have money? No, it's because you have relationships that would spare you that. Too many people adore you. Too many people love me to ever let that happen to me. How did these people end up on the streets but for a poverty of relationship, of people that say, no, we can't let that happen. When it comes to things like people say, we should just scoop them up and put them somewhere. You know, many, a few years ago, there was that conversation. We should scoop them all up and just put them in the shelters, in the empty beds. I mean, if you ask the shelter workers if they want to be policing the mentally ill to keep them in their shelters, um, the answer is no. So the answers are more sophisticated than... The, the, the powerful message of your book, as I read it, was that uh, every one of these people, regardless of the depredation, is created in the image of God. And time sure. and again, in and, and some of the most horrible situations, uh, you see that image reflected and you're inspired, you're uh, humbled, you're uh, challenged by it. Um, and there's any number of examples. We've got about four minutes left. I want to show a couple of pictures in a moment. But uh, of all of these people you talk about, maybe some you don't talk about, this is an unfair question. Who is the most moving of all for you? Who was the one that uh, confronted you with the image of God more than anyone? Is there one? Yeah, there was a severely, well, there wouldn't be one, but among the one, with the ones, just a severely, severely mentally ill woman who's in the back chapter of this book. Yeah who just is not aware of what's going on and tries to share this treasured mama with a child to the horror of her mother who catches up with it. This, 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 is, this is the well, final chapter the in the final book. Final chapter and with a sucker. And it's why the cover is that. The lollipop. Because that story was so monumental to me. And in that story, I, am, I just watch it go down. I'm not even part of the story. The little girl is sharing her lollipop with this very decrepit, homeless right. woman, toothless woman. Yeah. And the mother, when she discovers what's going on, is horrified that she's sharing body fluids with this street yes, person. Yes, because she's busy doing something else and talking to a friend while this is going on. What, what was the message to you in this? It was that the message, well, well, the message is the little girl. So as much scary as the whole scene is, and I'm a parent of two children, you wouldn't want these things to happen. But the little girl was not jaded. She was not broke. She, not, she could see a person there, not part of the cityscape, not something dirty, a person she could share her candy with. And how did we lose yeah. at least that insight, uh, that heartbeat? Except you become like a little child. Right. You won't see, let alone enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. Mm. Uh, we've got three pictures here. Uh, let's look at picture number one. Who's that? That's a guy named Wayne. He's on the pier in Nova Scotia. And just when I'm there, I'm there often visiting my friends at the Ark. Um, and we have different meetings there and stuff, and I always visit him. He's got CP, and he's kind of got no legs, no fingers on his hands, and he's beautiful, but often he's considered the scariest guy in the pier. You see people walk all the way around him, and I always think, he's the one guy on the pier who cannot hurt you. Yeah. So <laughs> CP? Cerebral yeah, palsy? I know, yeah, yeah. Cannot speak well. Now, here's somebody who's coming our way tomorrow, actually. Yeah. The Lieutenant Governor, David Onley. Yeah, David Onley, and he was down with us this summer, just uh, a few weeks ago. He was visiting four of the uh, street ministries in Toronto, um, Young Street Mission Gateway and Sanctuary, and us. And so he met us right uh, under the Gardner Expressway. That's at Spadina and Lakeshore, part of our team. Our on, his, team. Uh, on his scooter. And there's a yeah. face in the middle we recognize. Yeah, uh, Mr. Why, Ignatieff. Why, why, why was uh, Ignatieff opening his door to you? We held a major conference, um, several of us across the country and uh, in conjunction with EFC. And uh, we were invited in to talk about what we were trying to accomplish with that conference, not just with frontline workers and church, but how we were trying to speak to government. And uh, he was very gracious. We, we asked to be invited to all the parties' uh, chambers, and that's a picture from our time with the Liberals. 
So even while you've worked the streets all these years, you're starting to have a national impact. Are you hopeful that uh, the government might uh, uh, kick in and uh, work with you? Yeah, I mean, the approach, the approach we're taking is one, I am so tired of people trying to guilt other people into responding to things. We're trying to touch their intellect and their hearts at the same time and saying enough's enough, not from you, but like we could just keep going on with these same issues from generation yeah. to generation. Or we can say what's working and what's not working. Let's work together on that. The book is called Bent Hope, a street journal by Tim Huff. It's uh, published by Castle Key Books, just out. And the other book that we haven't talked about, but we showed you earlier, is The Cardboard Shack Beneath the Bridge. It's a children's book, also published by Castle, uh, Castle Key. Tim Huff not only wrote it, but he also illustrated it. Yeah. You're a man of many talents. <laughs> Thank Thanks for coming.